Hello everyone, welcome to the Diaspora Show on Center Africa Channel TV Station. I am your host today, my name is Abdul Rashid Abubakar. On today's show, I have here with me a very successful, brilliant and unique individual. You will all enjoy the show today, I promise you that. I'm talking about Dr. Mima Nadelkovic. Dr. Mima, welcome to the show. Today. Thank you, Preston. My pleasure. It's very fantastic to know that you spent more than 40 years working across the African continent. What inspires you about Africa? Can you tell me? Well, I started there. I was, and uh, thereafter, my whole career has one way or another been involved with Africa, either on the business side or the U.S. government side. So. You spent close to 40 years working in the African continent. Tell me, where do you see Africa in the next 10 years? Very good question. As I've been, I have the longitudinal view, very much so, and part of my excitement really on the continent is, is exactly what's happened very aggressively and progressively in the last few years. You know, really since independence, if you will, you had a period of time that the continent was developing relatively slowly. But I think we've really seen a kind of a peaking, particularly in the private sector development side. The investment, I mean, this last five to ten years has been massive, massive growth of, of the private sector, the middle, sort of the, the growing middle class, let's call it the spending class. I think the big changes on the continent are, I mean, there's twofold, you know, the major ones. One is the rapid growth of the population. We're going to be doubling to almost two billion in the continent. And the other major factor is urbanization. If you're getting to almost 50% urban, lifestyles are changing. You know, people, the Africa is no longer just the bush in the village. It's Welcome to the Diaspora Today Show. I'm your host, and my name is Abdul Rashid Abubakar. We are one on one here today with one of African brightest, successful, and well respected in the world. I'm talking about Jean Abinader, the executive director of Moroccan American Trade and Investment Center, an international business advisory. Hello, welcome to the show today. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. Can you tell us down memory line? how it all started? That's a really good question because in some ways it's almost a model for how to build good, strong bilateral relationships. In 2003, Mohammed VI, who was the king of Morocco since 1999, when he succeeded his father Hassan Du, came to the United States and visited with President George W. Bush. The idea was, how can we build stronger relationships between Morocco which was the first country to recognize the United States back in 1777, and the United States, which, as you know, is the world's most powerful country. And out of this discussion came the idea of having a free trade agreement between Morocco and the United States. And so the negotiations began, and in 2006, it came into force. What was really interesting about the free trade agreement is that it had a component encouraging Morocco to develop relations with the AGOA countries in terms of exports to the United States. In other words, if the textile industry in Morocco sourced a certain percentage of yarn and cotton and, and buttons and things like that from the AGOA countries, they could enter the United States duty-free. And so that was the first recognition from the American side that Morocco really was a player in Africa and someone with whom they could work to develop America's presence throughout the continent. Hello everyone, 
Welcome to the Diaspora Today Show on Center Africa TV and Victory One TV. I hope you all enjoy today's show. With me today, I have a brilliant individual, Mr. Gabriel Joshua Christian, U.S. attorney, educator, historian, and an African diaspora development activist. Welcome, Mr. Christian. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Brother Abdul. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, you're a great son of Africa, and I'm, we're all proud of your effort to enlighten us about uh, matters in Africa and the African diaspora. Thank you. Welcome. Um, can you tell us from the beginning, how did you become an African diaspora development activist? I think we're all products of our time and we are all shaped by the environment and the world within which we grew up. So I was born in Dominica in 1961, right? That is right around the time John F. Kennedy became president of the United States, right around the time Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement started developing, right, between, right, right around the time, uh, you know, Ghana came into the news three years or four years earlier, it's 57, it became independent, right, uh, right one year after uh, Nigeria, your country birth, right. I think Namdi Ezekwe. Uh, was the first president right. of Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria became independent of Britain. So Dominica was still a colony of Britain. So um, uh, uh, we were uh, there in North America, right next to the United States, if a society that had been formed by Africans, people who had come from Nigeria, Ghana and other places who had been taken, brought to the Caribbean like Dominica to grow sugarcane to provide wealth for Britain. And we were beginning to assert our, our self-determination in the same way Nigerians, Ghanaians, Senegalese, Algerians had begun to assert their self-determination. And so as a child, I began to hear the stories of Patrice Lumumba, Namdi Ezekwe, and I never forget, as a child, when the Biafran War took place in Biafra, uh, of course, you had uh, Ojuku, yes. and in the, in Nigeria you had uh, Yakubu Gowan. I remember clearly it was being discussed at our dinner table. My father had been in the British Army, he had served, he had been a member of the London Book Club since 1930. There are lots of books in our library, and there was also the Rosa Public Library that I would visit, and read Time Magazine and Music Magazine about the Civil War. I didn't know all the intricacies of the Civil War, but as I grew older, I could understand. And those things concerned me because as a person of color, someone who had roots in Africa, we wanted to understand how it is we had ended up in the Caribbean. What was going on in Africa? What could we do to better our condition in the Caribbean and in Africa? And of course, then you had the music of the time. James Brown, the famous African-American singer, uh, sang the song, Say It Loud. I'm black and I'm proud. So we also began to get prideful about our uh, condition as African people, people of color. We before were made to think or less than now we were very proud to be African. And so people started using African names like Kobe, like Kwame, uh, like uh, uh, Suleiman and all the things that could relate in their mind uh, a sense of African consciousness. And we started supporting the liberation movement in Angola, the liberation movement in Mozambique, the liberation movement in Guinea-Bissau, because we wanted those countries to be free of Portuguese colonial rule. At the same time, in the United States, because we're in English-speaking, North American territory, in places like Jamaica, you had Bob Marley, with uh, songs like uh, Africans Unite. He said, what a beautiful thing it would be before God and man to see the unification of all Africans. Wow. Wonderful, powerful song. So that was my generation. And those ideas, uh, that music, that conditioning, shaped me into becoming concerned about Africa, not in the abstract, but about its development. So its science, its technology, its industry could be used for the benefit of Africans at home and abroad. Uh, thank you, Mr. Christian. That was fantastic. So how would you like to see the African diaspora move forward? Well, I think the African Union has the right idea. I think uh, Africans overseas 
as well as Africans at home should unite in common endeavor. I was mentioning before we started speaking this morning that when the Ebola crisis took place, the country in the world that gave the most assistance was a country that had a huge African diaspora, and that was Cuba. They had a lot of doctors, and they sent a lot of doctors to Sierra Leone. Yeah, that was true. But I would like to have seen the AU also call on all the African countries to set up a laboratory protocol. So you'd have a, 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 a continental laboratory network. So laboratories for medical research in Ghana, in uh, Nigeria, in Angola, in South Africa could work on a uh, daily, weekly, monthly basis to exchange data and work on issues like malaria, sepsi fly disease, sleeping sickness, uh, Ebola, other uh, infectious diseases that affect the African population from an Afrocentric standpoint. I don't mean it in an ethnocentric way, because science is science, but we have to be, develop our internal capacity in Africa to deal with those things so that Africa is not totally dependent on outside resources. Now, the outside resources, whether it's African diaspora resources, or be it European or be it Chinese, we have to relate. I mean, I'm not trying to be exclusionary. Sometimes in uh, thinking about uh, you know, African development, sometimes people have a mistaken belief that we should live in the past and be concerned about what happened to us in the past. What happened in the past, like slavery, like colonialism, it happened. We have to learn from our mistakes. But I think the more important thing is what's happening now that we can do to unite our efforts, unite our resources in science and technology so we can uh, have entrepreneurship. Actual entrepreneurship so we can actually take control of our destiny. Just like what you're doing now. And nobody uh, gave you a huge pot of gold to set up your network, but you saw the need to educate our population, and you're doing a fine job. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Absolutely. You are also doing a great job. T together. You know, to, uh, to be, uh, you, know, active, uh, you know, an activist, to be in the forefront, to enlighten and to liberate, you know, you know our African brothers in the diaspora. Um, thank you on that note. Um, so where do you see the American-African relations since President Trump has now made it, you know, his priority, you know, for his political, on his political agenda, you know, to prioritize African country. Yes, uh, President Trump is an interesting person. He did have a meeting in, at the White House with the um, presidents of the historically black colleges and universities. So when the Civil War ended and Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, those who were abolitionists and who supported freedom for African Americans, white and black, got together and did develop universities like Fisk University, Howard University, uh, the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, and many universities, in fact a total of 126 universities all across the United States focused on agriculture, industry, literature, sciences, and so on. The great African-American educator, Booker T. Washington, set up Tuskegee Institute, which is now Tuskegee University. So the president, President Trump, brought those presidents in because he uh, claimed that he would be putting the federal government support behind the development of those institutions. Uh, we are not certain at this point in time how much of that commitment is real and how much of it is simply for political uh, uh, presentation, uh, but we are very hopeful that he commits to his word indeed, but I am more concerned about what it is we are doing. I believe that the future of the uh, African development uh, process resides in education. And that means we have to partner our universities in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Angola, with the universities in the African diaspora. They I think need, that is already going on. Um, not at the level that it should. Um, I believe we need to have, for instance, in every African country, using distance learning, uh, which is what this is. This is a form of distance learning because this video will be seen all over the world. Uh, partnerships that would allow, for instance, professors who have the competence in, let's say, informatics in uh, Washington to communicate that message to students in Senegal, to students in uh, Algeria, students in Angola, in Kenya. We need to be able to see those things happening now because many of the students in those areas may not have the money to fly over to the United States and pay for a U.S. education. However, if we can bring the education to them by uh, distance learning, or by setting up satellite campuses in country in partnership and have exchanges on a regular basis, then we can increase the competence in the arts and sciences of our population. Just like we have it now in uh, in Qatar. I was in Doha, you know, a couple of times, and I see they have the uh, George Washington University satellite campus. It's in Doha. interesting. I've been I, I, in 2009. I was a guest of Sheikh uh, Al Thani, Sheikh Moza. 
for the World Innovation Summit in Education right. as the founder of the Don Decker Academy of Arts and Sciences. Right. And I visited, it's on YouTube somewhere, I visited the University City where they have Carnegie Mellon, yes, they have, the they have uh, Virginia Commonwealth, they have the Qatar Foundation. Qatar Foundation is funding all this. They have Georgetown. Right, Georgetown. Um, yes. I'm not sure if they have Oxford, but that's the plan that they have. Yes. So they have the city and then all these U.S. universities are in Qatar. So is, if African you know, countries can, can do, the same. do the same thing. So now, I, I want us to go back. You know, I want you to backtrack for me a little bit because I want you to focus more on the U.S. African foreign policy. Yes. You know, Trump's predecessor, pre President Barack Obama, was very engaged with yes. African yes. countries. Yes. and in the African continent. Yes. But Trump said no to that. And most importantly that his Muslim, you know, immigrant immigration ban yes. has now been in, you know, effect. I think but you know, let me just say this. I think uh, that's short sighted. Um, and you have to understand the beauty of the United States. The United States is not a perfect country, but is that at least there's a division between the executive branch judicial branch and the, the legislative branch. So you see that he brought out his policy and so far at the judicial level it's been uh, denied on several occasions. That's wonderful because basically the court's ba basic response was that that was prejudicial. True. The United States Constitution uh, permits freedom of religion right? and they saw it as a uh, abridgment or an infringement, rather, of oh, that right, right freedom, freedom to religion. You know, that you're targeting a particular religion to exclude, or people from particular countries where their um, Islamist practice to exclude them, the courts were able to assert their independence, and that is good for the United States. So, as, good as a lawyer, yes. So, what is your take? My take is exactly what the court said that you cannot, you know, are we all concerned about terrorism, but you cannot just blanket condemn a whole religion because all you do actually is help the terrorists because our people can look at it and say oh you're a prejudiced person look at what you're doing and I think the courts were very wise he has to narrow the scope and say I have actionable evidence that people from this particular location are engaged in plans that are contrary to the US national security and deal with it on that basis but when you just make a blanket statement against Islam all you do is you create sentiments that are antagonistic and, tension. and tensions between Christians and Muslims that leads to no good end. And it's unnecessary. Oh, totally unnecessary. In fact, it's, I believe, contrary to U.S. national security interests, because the majority of people in Islamic countries do not support Al-Qaeda. The right. majority of people in Islamic countries do not support ISIS. Likewise, the Quran and does it, not support exactly. know, their, their doctrine, it, it, you know, whatever ISIS stand for, and whatever, you know, ISIL stand for, the Quran does not support that. It's almost as if you're saying, that average Christians support the Ku Klux Klan. You know, the Ku Klux Klan symbol was what? The burning cross. cross yes. The burning cross. Are well, you going to blame uh, Christians and say, you know, I'm not going to let Christians come into any country because you know what? Uh, the, the, the Klan, you know, is a Christian organization and they're an extremist organization, so all Christians are extremists. I think that's simplistic in the extreme. Uh, thank you, Mr. Christian. You're and uh, as an attorney, I want to uh, push you a little bit on what is going on now in the Middle East. Yes. Between the Emirates, UAE, Qatar, yes, yes. Saudi Arabia. Yes. You know, what do you have to say to that? Well, it's very unfortunate, first of all, that the Arab brothers and sisters are divided. I have been to Qatar as a guest of Sheikh Moza and Sheikh Al Thani. Thani. And I've been to Saudi as a guest of the royal family, Princess Madari. In 2010, we went to Riyadh. They wanted to set up a non-profit here for education and I've uh, known uh, Colonel al Rakaf, the uh, Major al Rakaf at the embassy. Because one of my clients is an Emir, Emir uh, Sheikh uh, uh, um, um, Salim Diaby, who is fluent in Arabic and uh, he used to do the Hajj for the embassy. So they knew him and he gave them my information and I was happy to have been there and I, I think the future of the Gulf the future of the Arab world requires a degree of uh, diplomacy that uh, avoids confrontation because one of the things that you see happening is where the Arab world cannot unite on principle that uh, focuses on uh, non-interference in the internal affairs of the respective countries and cooperation, then you find this sort of civil war as between Saudi Arabia and Yemen and within Libya you have 
maybe Qatar supporting one side, and Egypt and Saudi supporting the other side. And, and what, in Syria, we see America Syria, supporting one side, exactly, Russia supporting the other exactly. side. Exactly. And who's suffering? They say the Ummah, the people in the street, right. the ordinary person of Muslim persuasion. They're the ones who are suffering. Their country has been destroyed. The infrastructure has been destroyed. The cities, yeah, Aleppo, the, the history, the Palmyra, the crime, Mosul, that that uh, that uh, mosque has been there for a thousand years, destroyed. It's just when I look at it, I, I say to myself, people are not thinking; they've gone mad. So the fact is, whatever Qatar may have done, I think uh, we, I, I think they can make criticism also of Saudi Arabia. I think they need to find some. And they can make right. criticism of uh, United Arab Emirates. Absolutely. Because in those countries, there were people who supported extremism as well. Um, one can make criticism of the United States. When I was in a, a Georgetown University Law Center, the first war was coming up, the first Gulf War. I'm supposed to be studying for my bar exam. I found myself downtown in the demonstration against war. It's not because I agreed that Saddam Hussein should have gone into Kuwait, but I felt that we had to give the United Nations a little more time. We, tr we should try to get it to withdraw, because I felt that once the war started, it would open up a Pandora's box, and it would lead to endless war in the Middle East. Our worst fears have come to pass. Since that war in 1991, that area of the world has been in constant turmoil, and as a result, you've seen the, gro the growth of extremist organizations like Al-Qaeda, ISIS. Sometimes we need to be able to find non-lethal means to resolve conflict. We have to find ways other than military expeditions to end conflict. Because when you sometimes embark on a military expedition, as in the case of the United States and the Western powers, to evict Iraq, justifiably so in the degree, from Kuwait, and then you create a vacuum, then all the nature ab abhors a vacuum, then all kinds of things can happen that are unintended. There can be what you call the unintended consequences. And I think the sort of turmoil and extremism we see now, uh, because we have resorted sometimes too quick to military options, uh, is what is hurting the entire Middle East. And we don't want it to affect sub-Saharan Africa. Because we have Boko Haram in Nigeria, and I'm very concerned and about this. Al-Shabaab Al -Shabaab in, Al -Shabaab Somalia. in Somalia. And I'm concerned that those uh, 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 organizations can get uh, adherents where people are, dis are in despair. People have no education. They have limited economic opportunity. They have not uh, uh, embraced the principles of uh, civil society. You can get people uh, being drawn to extremism. And I think uh, as educators, as media people, as governments that are wise, we have to find ways to have conferences where people learn how to resolve conflict without resort to uh, religious animosity, religious hatred. We need people to be majestic in their being able to bring us together and not drive us apart. So in the beginning of this conversation, um, you mentioned the civil war, Nigeria civil war. Biafra. The Biafra war. So, I'm more interested... As a matter of fact, as a child, if we saw someone that was very thin, we'd say they're Biafran. <laughs> wow. Because in Biafra, there was a blockade, and there were a lot of people who had kwashioko, which is, uh, you know, a condition that has to do with uh, poor nutrition, nutritional input. Right. So, so I have a very vivid... So, recently, yes. the, the, the houses gave a verdict to the Igbos in, 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 in the northern Nigeria mm -hmm. that they should vacate... I did not Well, that's very sad because that was exactly... So what happened was you had the major school with, uh, in the early 64, I believe, when the first Nigerian government was overthrown. Unfortunately, when the army moved, a lot of the uh, officers who were killed were northerners, the Hausa. And there was a counter coup. There was a counter coup. And the counter coup was against officers who were mainly evil. Right? And that was the precursor to the civil war. Because the Northerners felt they were being abused by the coup makers in the army, that they were killing Northern officers. And then they, there was a counter coup which sought to um, suppress the, uh, let's say, power of the Igbo military caste, of which uh, Ojuku uh, was part of that. So when they started attacking the Igbo officers, a lot of their families who lived around the bases and the barracks in the north, they attacked them as well. Then the other Igbos who had gone north as traders and professionals as teachers, they attacked them as well. So they started running back 
to Eastern Nigeria, Igbo territory, and the people who are Hausa in that area, for whatever reason, they attacked them, and that's how the Civil War started. And I think we need to learn our history and understand our history and not get into such uh, sort of behavioral patterns that, that, that instigate right. the old uh, divisions. So, so you mentioned that that mentality of Biafra should be forgotten. I, I believe it is time for one Nigeria, it is time for one Africa. I mean, we can maintain our dignity and identity. identity but within a greater whole here you have United States you have people who are Irish American right people who are German American right the people who are Jewish American right. Jewish people American. who are African American American. but we still live and work uh, Hispanic American and Native American Asian American but we go to the same schools we go to the same restaurants we, we go, go to the same the same, universe, the same malls and we're not busy saying you get out from here what if the uh, Native American says all the people who are not here for the past thousand years go back to Europe, go back to Africa, where would we be? I mean, the, we're, we're in a world that's global, where people have moved, and I believe we need to be able to live together uh, under a rule of law regime where we don't appeal peacefully. to... Peacefully. We don't appeal to racial and uh, ethnic and religious animosity, because that is counterproductive. Because remember, when, for instance, during the war, World War II, the United States and Britain had to face the Germans, Two million, 2.8 million Africans and West Indians, mostly Africans because we, our islands don't have that many people, help Britain. Another million East Indians from India and one is Pakistan today help Britain. Without those resources, without those persons, Britain would not have survived. Even here in the United States, you had African Americans, the famous Tuskegee Airmen, right. fighting for freedom overseas they did not enjoy at home. So. If they had allowed themselves to be taken uh, by appeal to racial and ethnic animosity, they'd have not given their support to the freedom struggle. Similarly, in societies that are settled, where people can open a mosque, open a synagogue, open a church, what you have happening is that society is more attractive and people will visit, invest, and settle in that society. Societies where people are fighting over religion, burning churches, burning mosques, burning synagogues, hanging people because they're Muslim, hanging people because they're Christian, cutting off their heads. Who wants to visit that society? Wow. Nobody wants to visit that society. You don't have any cruise ships going to those societies. You don't have any tourism in those societies. Nobody wants to go take a vacation there. People go to countries where people have learned how to resolve their differences peacefully. peacefully. You go by the beach, you take a little drink, you go to the a park, you take pictures, you go by the monument, you take a picture. But if you're in a society where people are blowing up monuments, because that monument was built by a guy a thousand years ago who was not on my side. And then he would blow up your monument, which was built a thousand years ago because he's not on your side. Where, where are all our antiquities? Where are our museums? All of these things are tourist attractions that people from all over the world want to visit and see. see. So we have to look at this whole Igbo house schism in a more uh, universal, humanitarian, intelligent light. If we just give in to our passions, if we give in to our hates, every time there's an issue, we appeal to that base instinct, then that becomes very what you call backward thinking. If on the other hand we can understand the history and the uh, hurts of the uh, Nigerian Civil War of 1967-70, we can then build a better Nigeria and a better Africa. Because tribalism, tribal hatreds, divide and rule always allow for greater powers to come and rip off your resources. So while you're busy fighting each other, they are taking your resources. So, uh, congratulations, Mr. Christian. You was recently uh, honored the GSCE, which is in uh, the highest national, you know, award in Ethiopia. How do you feel about that? Oh, I feel great about it. For 23 years, we worked very hard for Ethiopia and Africa. We have been servants of the Crown Council. Uh, Prince Silasi now is looking to bring clean water to Ethiopia and other parts of Africa through the Argonaut system. The Argonaut system was developed by NASA technology. You know, when the space uh, explorers are in the shuttle, they can't bring water to them every week, you know, to bathe and to drink. They have to recycle their water, and it's a very good machine, because a lot of the malaria, a lot of the, uh, sorry, um, uh, parasitic uh, 
uh, or organisms like worms and, and other bacteria elements that are f to be found in uh, stagnant water pools that are in villages creates health problems in African villages. So if we can get clean water systems, we'll improve health care. If we can improve health care, we have better results in educational opportunity because people are now healthy, they're energetic, they're not falling asleep, they're not sick, they can now be able to absorb the education that we are going to put forth for them. And so it all starts with healthcare. If you don't have a healthy population, you cannot have an educated population because health and education are inextricably linked. So these are the kind of projects that, spring, that Prince Ermius Selassie, Selassie, Haile Selassie, the grandson of Emperor Selassie. I, sw I spoke to him to he, you the other day. Yes, he, these are the things that he has uh, been able to pioneer with uh, General Gregory Copley of the Strategic Services Organization. So the Crown Council and ourselves have worked well together and our law firm, uh, Mr. Christian, certainly uh, great support. Uh, we are happy to know that we're making our own little contribution to the onward march of African civilization. Yeah, and uh, also uh, to mention uh, your idea, you know, on Victory One TV, which yes. right now we are live, you know. Victory One TV, Victory One TV came about because I felt in the Metro DC, Washington area, which is a significant African descended population. DC is 65% African American, when yes. I came it was 75%. Uh, we need a, uh, platform that can uh, focus on community development of the African diaspora and bring a better message of Africa. Lots of times we get a message of Africa, we never get to see it to, uh, in, in the inside of an African physics lab. We never get to see inside the, uh, the, 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 the interior of an African factory making anything. We never get to see African pilots flying planes. We never get to see African farmers and uh, their, their farms growing a bountiful crop. We never get to see the uh, state-of-the-art fishing facilities that exist in many African countries. We never get to see inside of the best hotels in Africa. There are very nice hotels in Nigeria and other places. All we see are examples of starving children, uh, burning villages, squabbling tribes, negative images. So we need to craft an image that is more uh, objective, meaning it, it portrays the whole spectrum. We do have problems in Africa and we must not put those or sweep those under the carpet. We have to explore those so we can find meaningful solutions. Yeah. But we also have to show all the great things that are happening in Africa with its other partners in Asia and Europe and South America, North America. We need to see those images because what those images that are positive really do is inspires young persons to be proud about your heritage and by being proud to be more committed to aspiring to better things and to greater things. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Christian. Yes. Um, we'll continue um, on this show to explore um, partnership uh, with Victory One TV and... Uh, and Center Africa Broadcasting Corporation. And Center Africa Broadcasting uh, Network Corporation. Because, because the fact of the matter is we are on the same page and that's why we've entered today, the 28th of June 2017, the Strategic Alliance. Yes. So working together the two brothers uh, who, you know, a lo couple hundred years ago, yes. Abdul, we may have been on the beach talking and someone grabbed me, yes. took me over to Brazil, they grabbed you and they took you over to Jamaica, right. you know, but here we are. Here we are. Here we are together. You know, yes. it, it, it's 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 nice. You know, talking to you today. Yes. You know, and I want to thank you. You know, once again, I want to thank you know our team here. You know, uh, my brother Feliciano uh, Don. He's behind the camera. He's yes. doing a wonderful job. Yes, indeed. You know, and uh, and our sister know, Sanders. Sister Sanders yes, right. uh, from know, Columbia University. Yeah, yeah. Monique uh, Sanders. She, yes. she just uh, recently graduated a master's degree in social work. You know, she's also working with me on the we, African we, Islamic Economic Policy Foundation. Yes. You know, as yes. a research fellows, you know, yes. and also uh, our great teams, you know, that, you know, make this happen. We Absolutely. Thank everyone. Absolutely. We, to, we remember Dr. Ala Amimi. Yes, our Amimi. brother, Our brother from Pakistan. Yeah, Pakistan. Excellent scientist. Excellent guy. And yeah. he's the one who's brought us together. And we have to give kudos to him because, you know, we, we are able to work with all people. Yes. Uh, as long as they're sincere, yes. humanitarian. Yes. Uh, persons who have arrived at the level of human right. and are not stuck at the level of barbarian. Right. We're willing to work with them to better mankind and humankind in general. And I, 
I feel it's an honor and privilege to associate with you, sir. Thank you so much. You know, it's my, you. It's, it's my honor to be, you know, to be here with you today. Yes, indeed. You know, and I will also uh, bring you back on the show, yes, you know, to further explore, you know, and talk about, you know, African innovation and entrepreneurship. Yes, yes. You know, which is very central, yes. you know. Because we have to be bridges, as you said earlier, for technology transfer and expertise transfer. And we need to meet on that uh, basis so that we are able to produce more of that which we consume in technology. I want to see within the next 10 years an aviation industry in Africa. I want to see within the next 10 years a telephone industry in Africa. Where we can I make think Ethiopia is already, they are already oh, developing yes. a very huge... Yes. Um, Nigeria has a space agency. Yes. Ethiopia wants within the next five years to launch its rockets. Because right now Ethiopia is, uh, I'm sorry, Nigeria is launching satellites. But they're using platforms, I think, in India and China, maybe Russia as well. So uh, it'd be good to see that sort of development where um, we, we have that local competence. And so that's what I meant when you asked me, what does uh, the African Diaspora uh, Development Activist title mean to me? Uh, is being united, effective, productive. Wow. If we're united, right. we can be effective. Right. And if we're effective, then of course we must be productive. Must be productive. You know, so I, I, uh, I uh, believe that uh, the time is now and that we're doing the right thing. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Christian, and uh, thank you, everyone, you know, for uh, joining me today on the Diaspora Today Show. I will see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. The narrative for Africa is long-term. It's about progress and access to a market that is evolving and changing. And I think over the past 10 years, that Africa Rising story is really what is happening. The Initiative for Global Development is a network of global business leaders with a distinct mission to ensure that investments in Africa will deliver inclusive growth on the continent. It is really related to the actual environment in your country. The 2017 Frontier 100 Forum took place in Durban, South Africa and focused on business-driven solutions to address sustainable employment for African youth. This is really what IGD is doing and facilitating that engagement between different private sector players that can work effectively and produce a real impact. We began to see the commitment from private sector and based on what I've heard here, I then realized that we're going in the right direction, which is a good thing.
Hello everyone, we are uh, live from uh, of Reagan Building and the International Trade Center in Washington DC. This is the diaspora to the show. Like I said, um, we are here with the uh, President and uh, Chief Executive Officer of Strength for Africa, CFA. The organization that is doing tremendously when it comes to you know, U.S. Africa business policy. I want to welcome Mr. Melvin Foote. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's good to see you. Good to see you, good to see you too, sir. Yeah, you always wear the important things that happen. I always see you. Yes, sir. So, uh, Mr. Melvin, uh, this is uh, we're here today uh, at the uh, Frontier 100 Forum. Uh, of uh, initiative for global development. What do you have to say about the African economy and development? How can we move forward? From your event, we have a lot of conversation, very positive conversation. Now we are now at the IGD event. So how do we move African business forward? Well, you know, I, I truly believe that everything is about center. You know, you you got to organize people. You got to get people moving in the same direction. And uh, a lot of times, business like anything else can happen because people are all moving in the same direction, they have the same interest. And so uh, I think we're moving, we're making progress. Sometimes I ask myself, are we going forward or are we going backwards? But I think all in all, I see a lot of positive developments uh, concerning U.S.-Africa trade relationships. Uh, I, uh, I'm having some uh, early discussions with the administration, and I think there's an interest in uh, how can the U.S. government uh, uh, do well in Africa, do good in Africa. In other words, how do we encourage the U.S. businesses to do business in Africa, but at the same time, do business that makes sense for Africans and improve quality of life. So it's a, it's a nebulous question that you have, but I think we're moving in the right direction. But looking at it, looking at it as, 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 it, as, as it stands today, the current administration do not have, they don't have any representation when it comes to African policy, U.S. African policy. Uh, I don't say that. I, I met a uh, few weeks ago with the new senior director for Africa uh, at the National Security Council, which really is by the president. He's an African American. He's very committed to Africa. I was impressed with it. Um, and I am also going to pull it together on Monday to actually uh, you know, pull together some recommendations uh, for uh, Trump administration's uh, African economic policy. So, uh, I, you know, I've seen Republicans come, I've seen Democrats come, I've seen all kinds of come, but it just seems to me uh, some of it's on us. We've got to make sure that they have the right policy to expect in Africa. So, uh, so part of this is on the CFA and others who care about Africa. So, what message do you have for Africa all across the world? Uh, Africa, Africa is Africa is here. Now, Africa is going to be here. Africa is going forward one way or another. You're looking at the Chinese are there, the Indians are there, the Japanese are there. Everybody is going to Africa. I think that the young uh, African leadership is emerging. Uh, there's tons of young people in Africa who get it and who I think are looking out for Africa in the best way. Uh, so, you know, I think some of this, the struggle continues, you know. Uh, it's not like uh, this is a, a, you know, a three-year plan or a five-year plan. This is really a hundred-year plan. And we need to follow Kwame Nkrumah, we need to follow CLR Kane, Pat Moore. Um, there's nothing about that. This is not a short-term type thing. Nelson Mandela. I think, uh, you know, uh, what I'm doing is just a link in the chain. i got to make sure the next generation fully understands my work, uh, what I've learned in this period, so they don't, they don't have to go and relearn, you know. And so I see a big part of my job is uh, impacting and empowering the next generation of leadership on Africa, both in Africa and in the diaspora. I think uh, on the diaspora today show, we'll find more time to sit down with you in a, at the CFA office and talk more about your initiative for uh, moving Africa and moving forward. I look forward to that. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Uh, Thank you, sir. I hope this guy got us to take a good picture. That's it. I mean, I, I recorded it as well, so. But yeah, but we're we're currently streaming this live online.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program will begin shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program will begin shortly. My chairman, Mr. Robert Bosbacher, Jr., who has uh, been a great chairman and I hope I've been an equally good president. Mr. Chairman, welcome. You've done well, Nima. Um, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a great honor for me to uh, have a chance to introduce our next three speakers. Uh, and starting first with a good uh, and valued friend, uh, Mark Green, who uh, served for uh, four terms in the U.S. House of Representatives uh, before he was appointed, appointed ambassador to Tanzania uh, by President George W. Bush. Served there for a couple of years, uh, came back, went to work for the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, 
uh, and then he came to work for the Initiative for Global Development. So uh, there are few, uh, if any, who know this organization better than Mark, who aren't still working there. So, uh, so he 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 understands what uh, we are about, and he understands, I think, what you are about in terms of the importance of investment uh, and private sector driven economic growth. Um, and then he went to uh, the International Republican Institute where he was president until uh, he was recruited to become uh, the new administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. And I, I would just say um, I've had a chance to get to know Mark and, and from the first uh, time we spoke, it was very clear the passion he felt in his heart for uh, development in general, hope, opportunity, uh, but also for the continent of Africa in particular. And, uh, and his life experience involves a serious commitment of time and effort, particularly to East Africa, uh, but now I'm delighted that he has a chance to impact not just Africa, but uh, all the developing world. So it's a great privilege for me to introduce uh, my good friend, Mark Green. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thanks for those uh, kind words, and it's good to see all of you here. Now, uh, a few things have changed since my last uh, Frontier 100 forum. I'm on the other side of the microphone. But what really hasn't challenged, uh, changed is the importance of this organization and its mission. And that really is uh, what brings me here. But not only the organization and its mission, but the discussions all of you are having and will be having uh, as you get together. My principal goal as administrator has been to sharpen USCID's focus around two basic development themes. And in my way of thinking, they are inseparable. The first is that the purpose of foreign assistance must be to end the need for its existence. <clears throat> Every dollar we spend, every program we manage, every tool we deploy needs to move us just a little bit closer to that day when African leaders, public sector, private sector, civil society, private business in particular, can take over in a self-reliant way leadership of the challenges that their nations face. And so that really is what all of our work should be about. Now, there's a second thing that I think is irreplaceably important at USAID, and that is that the only sustainable way of reaching that goal is by tapping into private enterprise. Turning to all of you to help tackle the challenges and the opportunities that we all see. Now, traditionally, when the development community, including USAID, has referred to partnering with all of you in the business sector, we've largely met contracts, forging contracts. It has meant pre paying private organizations to do exactly what the public sector wants it to do on the terms, in the timeline, and in the places that we want you to do it. There's still room for that. If you all want to donate money to us, we'd be happy to take it. But of course, that misses the point. And it misses what the greatest opportunities are for lifting lives and building communities all across a continent that I believe has literally unlimited potential. Not only to rise for Africa's sake, but to rise for the world's sake. The contributions that Africans particularly young, emerging African leaders can make to the world economy, to the world's culture, to arts, sciences. And that really is what uh, brings us all here and why I think all of this matters so much. So, as all of you know, uh, the world is changing pretty rapidly. When USCID was started, more than five decades ago. 
80% or so of the capital flows from America to the developing world were traditional development assistance. These days, it's about 9%. And I think our job at USAID is to find ways to take that 9% to help unleash the 90%. And so what we're looking to do is to identify those irreplaceable value adds that we do have at USAID to help bolster enterprise-driven development. At USAID, our job, our obligation, our commitment to all of you must be to mobilize those capacities that we have in ways that will help you do more. So we want to use our convening power. That is a legitimate, important role for the public sector. We want to use our ability to incentivize and assist in policy reform. We want to help with the technical assistance that we can provide to enhance country capacity with smart, targeted regulations. And we want to mobilize our ability to identify artificial market failures and help to foster investments that can help take on and close those gaps. All of this we need to make available to all of you to unleash entrepreneurial activity. Activity that energizes inclusive growth and raises living standards. Two of USAID's most recent initiatives I think are beginning to capture and apply some of those principles. Number one, many of you know, is Feed the Future. And the second one is Power Africa. What my request is of all of you is to help us do more to help you do more. Help us identify those barriers to business, those artificial barriers and restrictions that you face in each potential market. Number two, help us to connect you to opportunities. And number three, help us more generally to listen better, to be real partners to you as you try to grow, sell more goods, build jobs, build services, and yeah, make money along the way. A story that... Uh, I'll close with but one that really touched me in a recent uh, journey that I did to uh, the Horn of Africa. I was traveling to Ethiopia to take a look at some of our food security programs. And I'll never forget because an important part of the day was to observe uh, food donations that we were providing. And at a food distribution in Ethiopia in the Somali region I walked through and I saw some families receiving sacks of grain. And there was one lady that I came across who was sitting next to a sack that she had just been given, and she was getting ready to take it back and divide it up with her family. And as I walked through, she tugged and she said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. And the question wasn't, can you give me some more grain, or can you give me some money? She said, can you help me with irrigation so I never need to take grain again? So I turned to the two reporters who are traveling with me and I said, there it is, that's it, right there. That's what we want to capture. That's what we want to mobilize. That's what we want to harness. That's what we want to use. Every human being wants to provide for themselves and their families. It is the dignity that we all have. That is what we have to turn to. So my commitment to you is that USAID will try to help you capture that woman's drive and apply it in ways that not only help her and her family, but make that contribution that we all know is essential to Africa's bright future. Good luck with your discussions. Uh, again, look at me and look at USAID as a partner. We want to help you do more. Because when you do more, that allows us to mobilize even further and to accomplish those goals that we all believe in so strongly, so heartily. So thank you. It's good to be here, and good luck.
very much for those comments and, and for your commitment. Mark uh, also uh, served for years on the board of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Uh, so he has that, that perspective. And, uh, and then he and I served as co-chairs of, uh, for eight years of something called the Consensus for Development Reform, which was made up of a bunch of primarily ex-Republican uh, administration development uh, and investment folks. So, uh, so his heart is truly there. Uh, next, I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the acting CEO of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, Jonathan Nash. And uh, Jonathan has uh, got more than 20 years of experience in international development and uh, currently oversees roughly $4 billion in economic assistance programs that uh, are designed to reduce poverty through uh, economic growth and opportunity. And uh, he's been at MCC since 2006. So uh, he's one of the veterans. And uh, I see Paul Applegarth over here was there at inception. Um, and, uh, and I think, uh, I think Jonathan would, would be uh, one of those who probably has great institutional memory. Him and, and Jonathan Bloom, a couple of Jonathan. So uh, anyway, the agency uh, is very lucky to have his leadership. Uh, we're delighted he's here. So please help me welcome Jonathan Nash. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for those kind words. And Mima, thanks for having us here today. Uh, so we can be know uh, Mima is one of our co-chairs of our Private Sector Advisory Council. So it's great to uh, be here this afternoon. Uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces uh, and some new faces as well. For those of you who aren't familiar with MCC, we are a U.S. Foreign Assistance Agency. Uh, we were created in 2004. We provide time-limited time grants and assistance to poor but well-governed countries. Uh, we call our grants compacts, and they range in size from $50 million to $700 million, uh, over a five-year period. We work across a number of sectors, energy, transportation, education, agriculture, and we're selective about where we uh, invest. Uh, over the last 13 years, we've invested nearly $12 billion uh, in economic growth projects. As Rob mentioned, we have a single mandate, that is to reduce uh, poverty through economic growth, and that's private sector-led economic growth. Uh, of that $12 billion, about 65% of that has been invested in Africa. We partnered with 23 African countries and currently have 14 active programs in Africa. Just a few weeks ago, our board of directors, and uh, Ambassador Mark Green is part of our board of directors, is chaired by the Secretary of State, uh, approved a new $525 million compact with Cote d'Ivoire. The program is designed to support economic growth and private investment by building workforce capacity, uh, reducing transportation costs, and opening new markets, benefiting the region, and firms looking to expand their business to both African businesses and U.S. businesses. We're looking forward to signing this compact uh, next month. As many of you know, uh, many, Afri many African governments today are increasingly stable and democratic. And from MCC's short uh, uh, experience, uh, but important experience, we see that our partners are increasingly committed to implementing reforms and working with the private sector to build an environment for businesses to invest. I'll give you a couple of examples from our portfolio. For example, in Malawi, uh, where firms consistently cite weaknesses in the electricity sector as one of the major obstacles to doing business. Today, MC with MCC support, the government of Malawi is working to modernize infrastructure and strengthen institutions in its power sector to expand accessibility and reliability while adapting policies that encourage accountability and private investment. What's been particularly impressive for us at MCC is to see the turnaround in the main power utility. Uh, when we first started working with Malawi a few years back, the utility was insolvent. Uh, it was, it was uh, deeply in the red. Uh, but uh, over the course of a couple of years, working with them to put in place certain reforms, uh, the utility is now in solid commercial footing to the point that last year and this year, they were able to uh, secure an investment grade credit rating. Uh, which is pretty impressive for uh, a power utility. Uh, this will allow them soon to go out and raise their own capital on the market, plus it gives investors confidence to partner with the utility. So this is just one example. In addition to Malawi, MCC investments have been in. Ghana, Liberia, and Sierra Leone are helping to strengthen electricity systems and support policy reforms that drive business participation in the sector. Uh, in Ghana, we expect MCC's $540 million investment in the power sector to catalyze nearly $4 billion dollars in new private investment, including major investments from GE, uh, Endeavor Energy, and Cosmos Energy. 
So our investments not only fund large-scale infrastructure projects, but also help governments make critical policy and institutional reforms that will help them both deliver better services to their people and catalyze business investment, and to achieve that goal that Master Green laid out of, of being self-sufficient. <coughs> In all of our programs, we look for opportunities to leverage public spending, much like USAID. Through public-private partnerships, we aim to mobilize the capital, expertise, and efficiency of the private sector to deliver faster, better, and more affordable services and generate more sustainable development outcomes. Over the course of our engagement with the partner country, MCC also engages with the private sector, other donors, local and international NGOs, and foundations. This gives our MCC investments every opportunity to spur additional follow-on uh, investment and accelerate and sustain poverty reduction long after our five-year investment comes to an end. Last year, MCC established an Office of Strategic Partnerships to provide a vision and strategy for MCC partnerships that align with the agency goals. The office is more fully incorporating partnerships into our work uh, to increase the scope, impact, and sustainability of our poverty fighting programs. We also launched the MCC Advisory Council, Private Sector Advisory Council. In fact, we've got a couple members here in the room with us, uh, along with, with Mima as the co-chair. This advisory council offers us a platform for systematic engagement with the private sector building on our ongoing work with the global business community. The Council's industry experience, expertise, insights, and technical recommendations help to inform and deepen MCC's public and private sector partnerships. As many of you know, the OECD will soon release its blended finance principles uh, for all of its members. MCC sees itself as a key supporting actor in the development of the blended finance sector. And we will align our business practices to incorporate these new principles. So MCC is focusing more systematically on using the full range of our toolkit to build new market opportunities in frontier economies and crowded private investors, as such as many of you are. It maximizes our impact and enhances the sustainability of our investments to partner with the private sector. And as new opportunities emerge, we're working to make sure U.S. businesses know about them. MCC is currently implementing a detailed market outreach strategy to inform, attract, and encourage American firms to work with MCC and to invest alongside of us. This includes a new work with us section on our website, which I encourage you all to visit at mcc.gov. Uh, this section provides a 12-month forecast of upcoming procurement and grant opportunities and identifies specific procurement and partnership opportunities suitable for U.S. firms and others, as well as an opportunity to solicit feedback on various participation so that we can help address those obstacles going forward. So I encourage you to visit that online and to consider partnering with MCC uh, in our projects across the continent. Again, it's great to be here. Thanks again, Mima, for inviting us. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, John, very much. Uh, our final speaker in this uh, group is uh, Ambassador Donald Yamamoto, who is Acting Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of African Affairs uh, at the State Department. Um, he is a, has had a long and distinguished diplomatic career, uh, having served in uh, Ethiopia, uh, Djibouti, and Somalia, as well as other regions of the world. Uh, before taking the position as acting assistant secretary, he served as senior vice president of the National Defense University. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Yamamoto. keep on getting taller and taller. <laughs> I made a speech that they prepared for me, and it's really uh, very bureaucratic. I said, yeah, I forget. Let me just give you a couple of data points and some stories about what we're looking at in Africa. So I just came back from the Hill just now, and I got hammered hard on, on our budget. So, it's, it, you know, I guess it's like when you go to your board of uh, directors and you say, you've got to explain, well, we're going to cut our budget 34%, and how is that going to be better? And so as we, we did. We're, we're looking at restructuring, as we call it. But let me just say that uh, when we're talking to the, to the members on the Hill, we're saying, look at a lot of the good things that have happened on, on investment and trade. So our total investment in 2001 was $9 billion, and it went up to $34 billion by uh, 2014. And our trade was $6 billion in 2000. Exports rose to $25 billion. And then 11 billion imports from, from Africa. But more important is you had $500 billion in manufacturing output. Today was the highlight to be a $1 trillion in a decade. So the question comes in, so I talked to the members, is so, so what? What is it that we as Americans really want in Africa? And I said, 
just has to step back and say, well, where is the final frontier? Where is that last hope? And the answer is Africa. I mean, if you've got to look at 2030, if one quarter of your consumers are going to be in Africa, by 2050, you know, you're going to have 2 billion, and that means the continent of Africa is going to have double the number of population over the nearest uh, regional area, then that's opportunity. It could also be problems and challenges, but it's opportunities. And that's what we said to the, to the, uh, to the members. And, and one of the things that, uh, that I was looking at is, you know, I'm a biochemist by background, I'm not a political scientist, so I, I, I don't do things like write really great reports. I go and look at things. And when I was in Eastern Congo for about four years leading our peace operations, is that I couldn't help but notice that I saw a lot of Chinese. I saw Iranians, I saw Russians, I saw a few North Koreans, I saw Israelis, and they said, yeah, I didn't see a lot of Americans. And I said, well, why is that? And so, I was at, so I went up on these, uh, these Chinese uh, workers, uh, and they were from um, the minority section of eastern China, and I said, well, what are you doing? I said, oh, well, we're digging, we're digging uh, forest trees, we're denuding the forest. Well, what are you doing that for? So we can build furniture to sell to you Americans. So, so then, then I went to this other group and said, well, what are you doing? He said, oh, we're, we're excavating titanium and talion. What are you doing with that? Oh, we're helping to make uh, Game Boys and cell phones to sell to you Americans. So, oh, okay. So, so I went back to Washington and I said, you know, I just came up on these Iranians and Russians and Chinese, and they're all saying that, they're developing titanium and talent. You know what that is? It's, it's a hard alloy. It's used for drill bits, but it's also used for missile tips and also for your sightings and your high-tech weapons. So I said to the Secretary of State, hey, wouldn't it be good that at the current rate of development that we'll probably start buying from North Koreans all this equipment? They didn't like that answer. So, yeah, so I spent the next 13 months in Afghanistan. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, we got to do, if, we want, if we're serious, about Africa, we got to look at the diversity and the, uh, and the opportunities that uh, Africa affords. And that means, yes, we got to do the basic fundamental things. we got to do investments. I don't like assistance, that's a bad word. Investments. We have to invest because we're there doing investing for our future as well. And so if we're going to do that, let's look at a whole wide range of areas. So I think what, what this opportunity in this administration has provided is a time to reflect, to sit back. So as I said to the members of Congress, yeah, we're going to decrease our overall budget by 34.5%. But, but this gives us an opportunity to say, well, what really matters in life? What is it that we need to do to provide opportunities for the future of the United States? And also the future for the, for the area. Um, and that's really a, 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 a crushing question that we don't have an answer to, but you guys do. That's why we're here to talk to you. But I want to give one story that I, I told to the uh, to our live audiences. So, my dad was the only survivor of his family during World War II. He was an Imperial Army officer out of Japan, and the only country that would give him a scholarship was the United States. Can you? Why would the U.S. do that to an enemy, a former enemy? And the answer is quite clear. It's good because the United States, unlike any other country, has that issue of extending a hand and saying, let's work together in partnership. That's, that's a great... I tried to do that with the Iranians when I was meeting them, and they said no. <laughs> so the other issue, too, is my mom was... Uh, her family was in a camp in California, and her uncle's fought with the Central Interway and the 442nd Hundred Infantry. But she got caught up in Japan during the war, and uh, she was under house arrest. Not because of her American passport, because she's a Catholic. That was, that was worse. But the issue comes in is that the, what, when they came back to the United States, or when my dad came, and they said, you know, the United States really treated us well, and so our kids are going to devote themselves to America. So I got the short stick, and that's why I'm in the State Department. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to do is kind of capture that, that dynamism. I don't think any other country in the world, except the United States, has that, that dynamism, creativity, and uh, openness, and really opportunities that I don't see in a lot of other countries. And I think if we can unleash this creativity, that we can really work together and make a difference, not only in the lives of the people in Africa, but the lives of the people here in the United States. And I think that would be a hard, great partnership. So I think, I think during Q&A, we have a lot more data and statistics. 
I want to say is um, when I was uh, working in uh, the Middle East Bureau and our Asia Bureau, um, I asked really inopportune questions like peace process and other things, and they said, you know, you need to go to Africa. Because Africa, you have an opportunity to speak your mind, but more important is to pursue ideas that really haven't been asked, and that's what we want to do. So all I can say to you guys is, is we love you, we want to be with you guys, we want to work with you, and we want to learn from you. And we want to develop this opportunity at this time. How do we develop a really good strategy for the future? And if we don't do it now, we ain't going to have this opportunity again. So thank you very much. Thank you for the panelists. I'm sorry, we're all fighting schedules here. But what I'd like to do, if I may introduce Carol Pino, award-winning journalist now, uh, operating and managing uh, industry, anchor for Africa Today TV, moderated the question, a discussion, if you will, moderated discussion with Ambassador Yamamoto. And we will then go straight into, because we're a little behind on time, into the legislative policy panel. Carol, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mima. So, welcome, Ambassador. We are just going to have a couple minutes discussion, because I know that you don't have a lot of time, but we wanted to just talk to you. You know, you've been talking about from the State Department. We've heard also from MCC, from USAID. You have a room full of people that are Africans and Africanists. What can Africans and Africanists do to help you get Africa to the forefront? Well, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, one thing in the United States is that, uh, you know, in the old days when I was working in, in uh, the Bureau, we said only one Africa issue at a time. Well, you know, I don't think anyone, I don't think the Africans got that memo. And, and so the issue comes in is that uh, I think right now is we have a, probably a really good strategy. So General McMasters uh, was one of our premier teachers and lecturers at the National Defense University, which is really our premier uh, training program.